Okay, it's my turn. It is my turn. There's nothing like being the last speaker on the last day of the conference. <laughs> so, for you 10 people that are here, man, you're going to hear something. The few, the proud, the Winter Conference crowd, 2012. Give yourself a big hand. Give yourself a big hand. There you're here. So let's begin with prayer. Father God, as we gather this morning uh, for... Uh, this last moment together to talk, to share, to witness, to be filled with your Holy Spirit. I just pray, Lord God, for the outpouring of your Spirit in a new and refreshing and a hopeful way here in Houston, Texas, for this winter conference to send us forth with your strength, with your power, with your Holy Spirit, which is the power for mission. And all the people said, Amen. Are you fired up? I'm fired up, I'm fired up, and I'll tell you why, because I'm going to speak for 38 and a half minutes. <laughs> At the end of which, whether I'm through with this or not, I'm gone, I'm out of here. But I want to come uh, this morning because I am really fired up. I'm excited about what God is doing, what God has done these last four days. Are you excited about that? You've got a big hand. Because if there's anything that we have to give to the world, it is two things, the personal holiness that T.J. talked about and the hope that is in us. Those people who give the most hope have the most influence. And that hope comes not from who we are or what we do, but from the power of the Holy Spirit moving inside us. And we are people of hope. Uh, there's a story about... Uh, um, uh, th this archaeologist that was digging around up in New York City. And as he dug down 10 feet, uh, he found some traces of a copper wire and came to the conclusion that 100 years ago, there had already been some kind of telephone wire uh, the, uh, system. Uh, not to be outdone in, in Los Angeles, there was a report about an archaeologist that dug down 20 feet and, and found some uh, traces of a copper wire, but figured 20 feet, okay, so... 200 years before that in Los Angeles, there had already been some kind of a network system. In Texas, at Rattlesnake Gulch, there was this uh, rancher that dug down 30 feet and found nothing and said, that shows you that 300 years ago we had wireless. <laughs> now that's hope. That's hope. That's what we do in Texas. I'm going to talk to you about, in this epiphany season, the story of the Magi that many of you might have heard or preached on uh, last Sunday, because it has as its theme, as its understanding, the way I take it, the reality of being able to prophesy our way forward in life, prophesying our way forward. You think about the Magi, these magicians, these stargazers, these uh, astrologer-type people, Gentiles from the East, and they, they see something. They see the same thing that a hundred thousands of other people had seen, some constellation of Jupiter and Mars and, and Saturn, and, and there was a glow and all that, and, and thousands of people saw it. But the Magi saw it and did something about it and said, let's follow that. They don't know about God. They don't know about the Bible. They don't know anything about Jewish history. But there's something in them that says, I want to follow that. And so as they begin to follow that, they take a step and they take a step and, and they end up in Jerusalem and they talk to Herod and they ask, well, what's supposed to be happening? And so scripture is opened up because Herod doesn't know scripture, so he finds somebody that knows scripture and opens up and they find this deal about the Christ child that's, that, that, that's to be born. There was something prophetic in the hearts of these magi, whoever they were, however many they were, that said, I don't think I understand everything. I don't think I know exactly what has happened, but there's something that, that's going to be birth, and we want to be part of it, and we want to see what's going on. And I think that that is a paradigm of what the Anglican Commission has been about. It's a paradigm of our own individual journeys. It's a paradigm of life. There was some way of prophesying their way forward, touched by the Holy Spirit that they didn't even know or heard about, touched by something that they didn't exactly understand, but they were willing to follow and willing to be a part of. 
this winter conference, Holy Spirit, the power for mission, probably what I was thinking a year ago of what exactly this conference would be like isn't exactly at all what it's like. Because of the events recently, the Holy Spirit has moved in a dynamic and a very powerfully real way. The tone of this winter conference has been much more life on life, much more about the heart, much less about the show, much less about showing off, and much more about the transformation that God wants to do inside each one of us as we prophesy our way forward, listening and walking in the power of that Holy Spirit daily. We, it began with Chuck's talk on Thursday morning. Actually, it began Wednesday when he and the founding archbishops talked to the clergy and began to kind of lay out all the past several months of what's happened to get clarity. Chuck's talk gave more clarity. And, and a, a, as you hear that talk and think about, you know, $46 million raised in 12 years and 250 or 60 church dots around the country, that didn't happen because there was great strategy. It didn't happen because there were great fundraising techniques. It happened because there's a vision from God that people got. They didn't know the fullness of what that was going to be, but they took a step and took a step and took a step, and then voila, the Anglican commission is birthed and is moving forward. Uh, the talks continued then uh, uh, later that morning with Reggie McNeil reminding us that, that as the Holy Spirit speaks to us about mission, about real people on the street, life on life, using new metrics. It's not about buildings and cash flow and the book of order. It's about lives being touched and transformed. Jack Deere the next day used this phrase, we never planned the turning points of our life. You just heard TJ talk about some of the turning points in his life. You heard Jack Deere talk about some of the turning points in his life. That's what the Holy Spirit does as, as you just try to understand, take a step and keep moving, following that star, not knowing exactly where it's going, but it's going and you're responding. Hundreds of thousands of other people saw the star. Hundreds of thousands of other people have heard God. Hundreds of thousands of other churches exist. But there's something that God has given anointing and favor on the Anglican mission. You never plan the turning points of your life. This moment, this week, is a turning point in the life of the Anglican mission. And I thank God for it. It's a new reformation in many ways because in the 21st century, I've always said, denominational walls are breaking down. This is a moment for a three-stream, spirit-filled, liturgical, Bible-teaching, Christ-centered type of expression of the faith. I'm not saying we got the corner of the market and all those things, but I'm saying there's something that God is doing through this expression, fully three-streamed, I get to in a moment, that's attracting unchurched people, underchurched people, and in my experience, overchurched people. <laughs> if you've been overchurched, raise your hand. There we go. Hell, that was all of you. Okay. <laughs> and then uh, Cindy Bruss, the Holy Spirit, talking about what God is doing throughout the mission and different examples of, uh, of that. And T.J. talking about the wilderness. Now, I know something about the physical wilderness. I, I, I was the rector, senior pastor of a church in East Texas for seven years, and then God moved me out to El Paso, Texas. You want to know the wilderness? Move out to El Paso, Texas. But just like T.J., it was actually some of the most fruitful years of our life in the wilderness in El Paso, Texas. Not only does God want us to go through the wilderness, we want to hang around people who have been in the spiritual wilderness because they know something. God has done some shaking in their lives. And that's what Bill Jackson was talking to us uh, over the past uh, three uh, mornings in the Bible study. God is doing some shaking here. He's got this prophetic word of what God is doing. And that shaking is, is getting out some of the lumps and things are getting homogenized and, and we don't see it all yet, but it's coming. It will always keep coming because there's always hope. Holy Spirit, power for mission. Holy Spirit, we first see him uh, revealed in Scripture in Genesis chapter 1, hovering over that which is void, hovering over that which is chaos and bringing order and bringing life. Uh, Holy Spirit being infused into the dirt of Genesis chapter 2, and out of that dirt comes life. The Holy Spirit still does that. Th this renewal that has taken place in the last 50 years in church life is, is bringing things to life like church planting. I went through seminary. I went through uh, almost 40 years of my life. I never heard about church planting. And then I went to a conference in Paul's Island of all places in 1996. 
and uh, never heard of a guy named John Shuler. He pulls us into his office. An hour later, we come out. We're drinking the Kool-Aid. We are church planters. <laughs> we want to plant a church. <laughs> Thirteen years later, it finally happens because we're kind of slow, but it came. <laughs> the Holy Spirit in, in, in the oh, I just love the, the work and the power of the Holy Spirit. It's the only thing we've got. It's the only power for mission. And Jesus Christ came to give us the Holy Spirit. Read John 14. Read John 15. Read John 16. Jesus said, I am leaving, but I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit. I'm not going to leave you as orphans. The Holy Spirit is going to reveal the truth to you. The Holy Spirit is going to give you life. He is the promise of the Father revealed in Genesis, revealed in Jeremiah, in Ezekiel, that great prophecy in Ezekiel 36. There will be a day when, when I will send a new spirit 600 years before Christ, and, and it will take out that heart of stone and give you that heart of flesh where you actually love God. You don't do things for, for God because you have to. You actually love Him. And you want Him. And He takes out that heart of stone and puts in a heart of flesh. It's coming, the Lord says to Ezekiel. To whom? To everyone, Joel says. Regardless of your background, Joel chapter 2. Regardless of your age. Regardless of your status in life. Regardless of your gender. Young and old. He's coming. Now look it up. Luke chapter 1, chapter 2. The Holy Spirit begins to pop up all over the place. In the belly of Elizabeth. In, in, in John the Baptist. In, in, in the revelation to Mary. In Simeon. Old man Simeon who comes to the temple. And the Holy Spirit says, you're not going to die until you see the Messiah. Day after day, week after week, month after month. Maybe year after year. He perseveres in the wilderness waiting to see the Messiah. And then the Holy Spirit speaks to him. That's what I love. That's what the word Simeon means. It means ability to hear. We can hear God. So we had workshops, tremendous workshops yesterday. Uh, the one I went to, prophetic words from Jack Deere in Dallas. And, and just learning to be able to hear God and, and, and move in that way. And then Jesus saying at the, after the resurrection, wait here because the promise of the Father is going to come from upon high. This is going to be the power for mission. This is going to be the power. But they don't know that. that Jesus said in all four Gospels, uh, I will baptize you in the Holy Spirit. But they didn't know what that meant. They had seen his life. They'd seen his death. They'd seen his resurrection. They're kind of impressed. But, but, you know, they're not exactly sure what this baptism of the Holy Spirit's about. So wait here for the promise of, from on high. And they wait and they pray and there's 120 of them and Mary's there and they roll the dice to pick a you know, replacement for Judas kind of and all that kind of thing. And then all of a sudden on that Pentecost day, the Holy Spirit comes. Something like great wind. Something like tongues of fire come upon him. And, and we've had this Bible study on the book of Acts and, and, and every teaching at every winter conference there's been something about the book of Acts because we look at that and say that's what it can look like. The stuff hasn't stopped. And you know that when you are filled with the Holy Spirit, baptized in the Holy Spirit, that's a biblical word. You don't like it. We'll change the Bible, but that's what it says. And John the Baptist says, I baptize you with water, but he's going to come. He's going to baptize you with fire from the Holy Spirit. Things come alive, just like they did in Genesis at creation, just like they did in the garden with that dirt, with that mound, with that clay, just like he's doing in your lives and our lives, just like he's doing in the mission, just like he's doing in the world. God is already on mission. 